We are delighted to have with us Dr. Samir Hamada, who we first heard of a number of years ago in one of our most favourite and well-received talks that we've ever had at one of our conferences by Fern Lullum. And she told us how wonderful Samir was as her ophthalmologist. And so we thought we had to get him along to one of our conferences. And so now we have. So welcome and please go ahead, Samir. Thank you. Oh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me today. So I'll try to share some slides with you today. I have some key messages here. And excuse me if some of the languages look very scientific, but I'll try to make things very simple. So I think they're nice key facts to understand. And that will help understanding how we can identify stem cells at early stage, what early prevention we can do, and the current therapies. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about cornea stem cells, stem cell deficiency, why early intervention and what modalities of treatment we have. And I'm sure you're familiar with this FOMO and JOMO, the fear of missing out to joy missing out. We like to stay away from social media, Instagram, people obsessed with their phones, with their uh, computers, etc. want people to focus on real life. However, when it comes to something to do with eye surface disease, especially in children, I think we have to be careful here not to miss out on very essential diagnosis because a lot of conditions labeled as a rare disease in children and adults indeed are actually common. It's just we're not looking for it enough. And this is a message not for you as patients or parents, this is for professionals really. What we're talking here about some disorders of the eye surface and part of it is stem cell deficiency. So uh, with stem cell deficiency, as you know, is the deficiency of the cornea stem cells or the conjunctiva. But when we talk about eye surface inflammation or disease, this is disorder of the cornea of conjunctiva, even the tear film. And the condition that can be that could be congenital, and part of it is aniridia, and that's what we're talking here today, or there are long list of acquired causes of other surface disease. So when you talk about rare or common, these are some of the conditions that I'm trying to convince my colleagues that actually they are more common than we think, and we need to address that. And I have to say I've been successful in talking about Keratitis, blepharitis, dry eye disease, vernalis in children, exposure disease, keratoconus in children. But now I'm really having more uh, mission, let's call it, to talk about early diagnosis of stem cell deficiency. So this is the cases we don't want to see. So if you can look at these eyes, you can see the cornea in the periphery, actually the lower third of the cornea cover with haze, a scar, and a lot of blood vessels growing in the cornea. And we put those drops on fluorescein on the bottom photos. You can see that very funny coloring here. This is staining of the cornea. This is like conjunctiva, which is meant to be covering the white part of the eyes growing on top of the cornea. That's called conjunctivalization. So the cornea actually stem cells on the lower part is missing. And that's why the conjunctiva is growing over the cornea because there's no barrier here. So the limbus, this is where the stem cells sitting and living. And if you look at the picture here, there's the cornea, obviously, in the center. Around the cornea, that junction called the limbus, and that separates the conjunctiva from the cornea. So in that limbus, you can think of it like a barrier to stop the vessels and the cells on the conjunctiva to migrate on the cornea, plus providing all the stem cells to replace cells that shed away from the surface of the cornea. And maybe I can show you this. This is a nice image, which actually show you, you see those cells in blue, these are all epithelial cells. So we're talking about the blue cells are the epithelium. And there's obviously you've got another four layers below it. Those are the cornea layers. But the epithelium that is a 50 for four micron exactly is conformed of layers of cells called the epithelial cells. And with those cells, you've got stem cells, which give you the new cells to cover the epithelium because you know the epithelium constantly regenerate. So cells shed from the surface and replaced by the new cells. So stem cells sitting, if you see on the left here, there is a, like a dip here, it's called the limbus, and there's a niche where the stem cell reside. So those cells, if you can see those with green color, these are cells called limbal stem cells. The cells in yellow, these are cells actually, daughters of the green cells, and they migrate along the deeper layer of the epithelium. And when the other cells, the mature blue cells, these are the epithelial cells, when they shed away, then those yellow cells will grow to the surface to replace it. So when you think of it, it's great. So we know now where this stem cell living in the limbus area, 
and if there are any issue with the lymphocytes, they might be affected or damaged. And this just show you the life of the cells. So when we look at compared cells, don't need to worry much about these details here, but the limbal stem cells go into something called transient amplification cells. There are cells actually ready when you are healthy and you look at the line, say status of health. So limbal stem cells actually, they're quiet. They don't do anything. They're resting. But you got the TIC. These are the cells that are always active. They try to replenish the cells that shed, which are on the right-hand side, those terminally differentiated cells. These are the cells of the epithelium. So when you have a wounding, so you have a, any trauma, any scratch on the surface, whatever, suddenly those stem cells are quiet, suddenly become active, and they can divide and multiply quickly. While the transit application cells is ready, able to divide, they don't necessarily multiply, but they divide giving the one, give two, and the two become four, and so on, and they quickly replenish more epithelial cells. While the cells that mature already, they don't divide. So here we're talking about the stem cells loss. When you hear some cell deficiency and in aniridia, a lot of people talk about the cells gone. Well, actually, that would not necessarily be true. Maybe the cells lost completely, but they may be distressed, maybe dysfunctional. Dysfunctional, sometimes you've got some disorders, make those cells not function the same way they should do. Basically, simple example, these cells don't divide anymore. That is dysfunction cell. Distressed, that means you have a situation where you have the function of the cells are not great, but actually it can recover. So if you lose cells, it cannot recover. If they are distressed, you can treat it. You can recover cells because the cells are still there, but simply they're not in the right environment to work well. And when you talk about limbal stem cell deficiency, people are still talking about you lost the cells. Basically, you end up with a surface of the eye that is very inflamed. The cornea lost its integrity, where it can maintain clarity, and the comfort is an issue number one. Then the vision starts to become reduced, and then the conjunctiva take over, cover the whole cornea, and you end up with what's called cornea panos. These are just a, a sheet of scar growing onto the cornea and the vision. And just to remind you, this, the epithelium on the surface speaks to the cornea, all the stroma beneath it all the time. So if there's stem cell deficiency, the epithelium is not healthy, the stroma is upset, and the stroma will develop a scarring. So these are examples where actually the limbus area, you can see that the junction between the white and the black, the cornea, it's gone. There's no features here. It's all covered by vessels and the conjunctiva. When it comes to aniridia, we know, and this is very important, that we recognize that something called aniridic keratopathy. This is a change I showed you on the cornea. This is part of the aniridic keratopathy. This is a damage of the surface of the eye. The cornea stem cell happened in 90%, 100%, 90% of patients with aniridia. So what happened when you're a patient with aniridia as a child, infant, they found they have a normal, healthy cornea. But early changes start to happen, and mainly in the peripheral cornea. And that's usually when you have a little bit of a growth of opaque opacities. As you can see here, on the left, this is a cornea that in the center is still reasonably clear, but in the periphery, you start to see that haze, start to see vessels growing. And it takes a while for the central part of the cornea to become scar invaded by the peripheral changes. So when you look back here, you can see that gradually the cornea is losing its clarity because more and more scar and vessels grow in the center of the cornea. That obviously leads to visual loss with time and opacification in the stroma, scarring on the cornea, and then stem cell alone is not enough. You need to do cornea transplantation. So this is an interesting bit now because we found actually the patient with the aniridia, the problem is not just about stem cells, not genetic defect, Pax 6 expression of those cells is a problem. Actually, the problem is in the tear film, in the glands produce the water, in the meibomian glands sitting inside the eyelid and it produce the oil. So all components of the tear film from the oil to the water are affected in aniridia. So we're talking about dry eyes. We're talking about patients with dry eye from a start, from early childhood. And that have a primary effect, obviously, on the condition because your eyes dry, mean inflamed. So actually, there's acceleration, and this is important to understand, there's acceleration in the damage of the stem cells. Stem cells are very delicate cells. They hide actually deep in the cornea to protect themselves. In the niche, as I showed you, they're not on the surface. They're quite deep. Not that deep, you think. It's, I'm talking about microns here, but they don't like the environment up there because they might be affected. So dry surface lead to inflammatory changes, and then the stem cells start to suffer. They're already borderline. They're already defected. 
And the secondary effect, when damage happened to the surface, because you start having corneal abrasions, ulceration, all that, repair mechanism is affected, is not good, because guess what? The eye surface is dry. There's not enough water or the, And you hear it all the time. Oh, you have a dry eye, you have an iridia. But actually, that's since you're born. This is not happening later on. And this is my message here. We need to address this at very, very early stage. And this is a very, very nice picture because if you see things in blue, these are coming from the same surface of the dermal cells. This is actually where you have a, an area you have a stem cell deficiency because back sex expression in those cells affected, actually affecting the lens, affecting the cornea, affecting the gland you can see on the left, the lacrimal gland, as well as the bone glands. So straight away, you've got a disease already affecting your water glands. And this is very nice research. This is the 2021 published in Ocular Surface magazine. I just read one line, which is very important. It's an evidence base. It's done on, on a lab. So what they say is here, they found that, for example, a central cornea, the inspection of the central cornea in a four-year-old child with congenital aniridia should reduce sensitivity to mechanical touch. And the nerves density in these corneas are not the same. You know the corneal nerves are the feeder. They sense the surface of the cornea and feed into the reflex to wet the cornea. So if your corneal nerves is reduced because you have an iridia, then the mechanism, the reflex to wet the eye and to rescue the eye surface is absent. And this is a problem. So you don't have the water, you have dry eye. You have the reflex mechanism reduced. So no wonder you suffer quickly. So early detection and management is very, very important because that means better outcomes. Rather than seeing those cornea and iridia patients with damage to the surface at early, like in the age 15 plus, we want to defer the changes, you know, defer the need to any surgical intervention for later on. We see so many young patients now with disease. And if you look at the history, nobody really bothered too much looking at their eye surface and managing dry eye. So the protection obviously important. That's how the surface, the cornea, the conjunctiva need protection. So we need a normal lid function. The blinking is normal. The position is normal. These are small things I always teach my colleagues about what to look for when you assess the eye surface. Because all here, you're trying to, what's called maintaining optimal microenvironment, that is the eye surface. So you want to have normal blink, full blink. The frequency is normal. The sensation of the corner is normal. The tear film, the water is enough in quantity and quality. The external gl glands are good and all that. And if there's any failure of those mechanism, then you got more ocular surface failure. So we're not going to go through this, but there are a lot of signs which as doctors, we can see ophthalmologists or optometrists to say that actually the eye surface is compromised, need help. We don't see this picture here where the cornea already you have a 36 degree stem cell deficiency. So the intervention is very simple. I say we need to assess if the eye wet or dry and lid malposition. These are the key things that we address. So early detection, obviously, as I said, essential. And this is in your hands as patient, as family, in our hands as a practitioner to identify this. So please, please, if you take a child, if you are a young person with aniridia, tell your practitioner, your ophthalmologist or optometrist, can you check if my eye is dry? Is my corneal sensation is all right? These are the very key important things. Because there's no time, let's just briefly go through surgical intervention. Because there are small things usually done to protect the surface before doing anything else. From blocking the blood vessels, this is what we call fine needle diathermy and injecting some anti-VGF, which is to stop vessel formation, to regularizing the surface by doing a very small peeling of the scar of the cornea, to control inflammation by using amniotic membrane transplantation, steroid injection, etc. And finally, obviously, stem cell transplantation. And there's a loads of ways to do transplantation. So this is, for example, one of the old modalities where you take that limbus from a donor cornea and you put the whole piece, as you can see on top images, you stitch on the surface of the eye and the limbus where it should be because there's no cells. But that's moved now on, said, actually, that tissue, we don't need all that. All you need is a piece of the tissue. As you can see here, the scientist in the lab, in our eye bank in East Greenland here, he's cutting that limbus. He cut it into tiny pieces and they let those cells grow. That's called ex vivo. So this is a culture of the cells over three weeks. And by the end of that, you have a nice sheet of cells which actually grow in the, on the right-hand side, you can see that transplant to the patient's surface, the eye. Since 2012, I've been doing this surgery called Comet. And what we do here, rather than taking cells from a donor, why don't take cells from your mouth? This is our epithelial cells. So we take a small biopsy from inside the lip and we send to the eye bank, what they do, they grow these cells, they mature cells. 
with time in the eye bag, these cells become progenerators and mean the cells that can divide and bring daughter cells. And maybe there's some genuinely true stem cells in that sheet, which we transplant later to the patient eye. So we're taking cells from the mouth and to reconstruct the eye surface. So as you can see the steps here, cells from the mouth, three weeks in the laboratory, back to the surface of the eye. And this is kind of the sheet of cells. It's just a sheet of cells. There's nothing else here. And it's, this is like a white digger dam just so the cells to, to be uh, to mounted on it to be transplanted to the patient's eye. And these cells just done a lot of work to show that actually this is the mouth become like a nice cells. And these are cells laid down on the surface of the eye. And you don't have to look at these images if you don't like seeing some surgery here. But this is simple. We take a very small biopsy from the lab and this is sent to the lab. Three weeks later, this is a, I um, have the sheet of cells ready. I prepare the surface of the eye. Look at that. This is what I'm holding in my, I'm, I'm laying down the cells on the surface of the cornea. Make sure that it's, it's, it's settling well. I have another sheet of cells. I put it around the limbal area. This all pure cells that are able to generate and give a new limbus, right? So these cells, I'm lying down here around the limbal area. And then finish, obviously, I put amniotic membrane to cover everything. And so this is like uh, covered. And, and we used to stitch now all that done with the glue. So there's no stitching at all. So we moved a lot here with that. And rather than transplanting the whole tissue, we're transplanting cells. And that's what we're looking for. The other procedure to finish with is called simple limbal epithelial transplantation, SLED. And it shows promising results as well. In this way, rather than we grow the cells in the lab, we grow it on the patient's surface of the eye. So we take a very small piece of tissue and the very small pieces of the limbus, we transplant on the surface of the eye. That's called in vivo because actually I'm implanting the cells on the surface of the eye and make sure that they have the right microenvironment for these cells to grow and proliferate. And the white piece you see, these are pieces of the limbus from a donor. You can take from the patient other eye, but in the both eyes are affected usually. So you're going to do it from a donor. So just a few examples. So I just finished with this slide to say limbal stem cell deficiency management. It's successful, but you need to look at various factors. And successful, especially if you have an early management and early detection of ocular surface compromise. And that needs you, your network, need the professionals, need me speak to optometrist, speak to the ophthalmologist, especially pediatrics in children, speak to other colleagues who treat patients with the anridia because we need to raise awareness about management of ocular surface, especially now the evidence is there. I've been talking about it 10 years ago, but now actually all these papers coming out to confirm what we're talking about from clinical side. Now we can see it in the lab, there is strong evidence. So remember, it's challenging, but again, it's patient expectation, it's time consuming, but definitely rewarding. So I'll leave my email to you, s.hamada at nhs.net. Feel free to email me any question you like. Happy to come talk to you again another time if you want to go in details on this. But this is a very important topic. And thank you for inviting me today. Thank you very much, Samir. An amazing talk there. Um, it's a very common topic that we get asked about a lot um, around limbal stem cells and, uh, and cornea disease. So yeah, I'm sure there will be some questions coming to you. Uh, Gabrielle, she asked, uh, I have a son with aniridia and I would like to know about some eye drops for treatment. And what are the advances uh, and fit stem cell studies because I have my son's stem cells from the record. So at the moment, um, we don't have any program in the uh, UK to use uh, stem cells from the umbilical cord to expand the cells, but maybe there's something in future. At the moment, we, we do stem cell transplantation. As I mentioned earlier, this can be from the cells taken from the, from the inside the lip, from the mouth, mouth to eye cell transplantation, or cells from the donor. That's uh, usually donated corneas with energy, obviously, because both eyes affected, you can't take tissue or stem cell from the other eye. So there are moder modalities. There are no drops to treat stem cells. Failure, if the cells failed, it's failed. Unfortunately, you transplant cells. However, if the cells are borderline dysfunctional, which is a lot of the time is the case, it's, uh, there is a optimizing the eye surface, and this is extremely, extremely important. I can't emphasize how important that to optimize the eye surface. Optimizing mean stop the eye getting dry, stop any inflammation, stop eye rubbing, all the things that can minimize the, the ongoing damage to the eye surface to those cells which are really weak and can't stand the trauma, environmental trauma, let's call it. So next question by Jamie. Jamie asks, why are stem cells from the mouth better than those from the other elsewhere? Maybe they have the same genetic issues. 
how long typically the benefit lasts for and what are the upper and lower bounds, average and sight returning towards pre-surgery. It's difficult to treatment using mouth rather than other stem cells. One site is lost against another stem cell transplant, possibly. How does this balance against the risk of the surgeries and media triggering and the different process? Okay, so that is a big question. <laughs> we could give it a whole talk for an hour at least about that. So, first of all, the advantage of having the cells from the mouth that actually, A, there is no rejection here. This is auto cells, so cells from me to me and there's no risk of rejection. Yes, there's inflammation, and controlling the inflammation in the first two, three weeks is the key for success. Uh, and protect that by giving drops, we use amniotic membrane covering those cells, and that's how we make it survive. We done a study in our eye hospital, we compared the cells from, the, from myself, from mouth to eye, or cells from taken from someone else, donor. So either auto versus allograft, they call it stem cell transplantation. And we found the comparable success rate 60% over five years. The success rate, unfortunately, varies so much depending on the original condition. So more inflammation, it's more likely to fail. And the media cases, however, as long as inflammation is under control, the success rate is, is pretty good. In terms of comparing with the results as a, as a modality of treatment, you're right, there are various modalities of treatment. However, when you use the cells from the mouth, as I said, first is no rejection. Second, uh, there is a, you can repeat the sur surgery as many times as required. Three, it's, we found in our studies that actually a lot of times doing this first, it helped to increase the success rate to great deal when you do uh, auto cells, when you take cells from someone else. Because what you do, you optimize the surface and you put like a new layer on the surface from the mouth. Those are expand and populate the surface of the eye. If you future need more of those cells from the mouth, you can do it. If you find you need cells from a donor, then yes, it can be done. And the sex rate in that case will be even better and higher. And that's not just our studies, it's international work as well. Uh, I hope that answers your question. It's quite long, but obviously, please always free to ask me more questions and I'm happy to answer. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.